These are times that we live in, my respected brothers, where sometimes you, you, you have no idea what's behind the corner. You have no idea what's in, in, in place that could easily swift you, swift you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he said, a day will come before the day of Qiyamah when a person holding on to their faith will be like one holding on to a hot piece of coal. You imagine when you're doing the barbecue and your finger just touches the grill a little bit. See what happens to your finger. So imagine a person holding on to a coal. For some people, they'll be holding on to a coal which isn't that hot. And for some people, they'll be holding on to a coal that's been burning for hours. And this is what happens to us when we forget what Islam came for. Islam came to change the whole system of this dunya. It came to bring in a system which was to make people live in a way that was conducive to justice. That was helping them become better people, whether it's men, whether it's women. So this Dajjal, my respected brothers and sisters, is very important for us to understand. The Arabic word Dajjal actually comes from a sword. The Arabs would have a sword known as a Saifu Dajjal. The Dajjal sword. This Dajjal sword, I don't know if any of you guys have seen those mobile phones or some of these cars that have uh, colors that change depending on how much light is shining on them. This is what is known as a Dajjal sword. It's a sword when you shine it in the sky, it has a psychedelic color to it. Looks a bit red sometimes, looks a bit yellow sometimes, looks a bit green sometimes. This is what the Arabs called the Dajjal because it was deceptive in the sun. And the Prophet Sallallahu calling this individual al masihu Dajjal, the Messiah the Dajjal, is because this individual will come in so many different colors, will show himself in so many different ways that people will not be able to tell that has this guy really come with sincere motives? Or is this guy a deceiver? The life we're living today, my respected brothers, many of us can see in our lives today, we're slowly beginning to see the roadmap of Dajjal being laid out by his followers. People on social media want to show themselves in a different color. People in their families, in their relatives, want to show themselves in a different way. All of these things are things that are against the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, he taught al-ikhlas, sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will not judge you by what you look like. And he will not judge you by how much wealth you have stored away in your bank account. Allah will judge you by your heart and your actions. This is what our Prophet ﷺ, he came with. Many youngsters now are pressured into showing themselves in a different form. This used to be a problem for us. Now this isn't a problem anymore. Because things have become so worse now that society is now creating artificial intelligence that can give you any image you want. You can appear lighter than your tone of your skin. You can appear richer than what you are. You can appear younger than who you are. All of this can be done with artificial intelligence. And there's lots of studies that have actually been done on artificial intelligence. One of them is done by a guy, his name is, his name is a, he's an atheist. His name is Noah Yuvral Harari. He has a book called Homo Dios. And in this book, he mentions about how, he, say, he mentions about how in the future, he says artificial intelligence will actually become detrimental to identity of human beings. In other words, in simple terms, Artificial intelligence will begin to dictate to human beings of how they should live their lives. And he says the way this was actually proven was in the vote system in America when Cambridge Analytica, this was an organization that was known for manipulating people on social media. They would show you what they wanted to show you. The algorithms were designed in such a way that anyone who would look and watch their, 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 their reels or their walls on their social media would be shown the thing they wanted you to become influenced by. So if they wanted you to believe that a particular politician 
was a corrupt and bad politician, they would show you the right things that would influence you. And if they wanted to show you this particular celebrity is to be praised and given likes, they would show you them in a particular light. And this PR that this artificial intelligence will be doing is going to change the map of the world. And we've only seen recently with Gaza, we've only seen it recently with, with Palestine, that the algorithm actually broke. The people's voices was actually stronger than the AI. PR didn't work anymore. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he wants to show the haqq, nothing can stop the haqq from becoming, becoming apparent. And when Allah wants to destroy the batil, nothing can stop the batil from becoming exposed. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu he says, <coughs> in the hadith to Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, he says, Ya ghulam, ihfadillah yahfadak. Protect Allah's religion and Allah will protect you. Protect Allah's religion and you will find Allah anywhere in your life. He says, if all of mankind got together to harm you, to harm you a single amount of harm, but Allah had not written down this harm for you, nothing could bring that harm to you. And if all of mankind got together to give you some sort of benefit, and Allah had not written that for you, no benefit would be given to you. Rufi'atil aqlam, the pens of Allah have been lifted and the pages have dried. Nothing is going to change. This is why my respected brothers, I want to summarize to you. I want to summarize to you Surah Al-Kahf because Surah Al-Kahf, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the one who reads Surah Al-Kahf every Friday will be protected from the fitna of Dajjal. And in one narration he says, whoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf will be protected from the fitna of Dajjal. So this surah must have the key to our protection. Understanding what this surah means, my respected brothers, is the way that we are going to get through all of this. There are three things that this surah mentions, three things this surah mentions, which in our times today are rampant. Number one, this surah talks about materialism. How people will be so indulged, will be so engrossed in the love of this dunya, in working after this dunya, in earning after this dunya. You have a guy, he's brought a house, alhamdulillah, he lives in his house, but now he wants another house. So he gets himself a higher paid job. He gets himself a second job. His wife's also working as well. He's put his kids into school, he's put his kids into tuition. Doesn't get to meet his kids throughout the week. One month goes by, two months goes by, when holidays come, two weeks holiday, they're together. And then the year goes by, who's doing the tarbiyah of these children? Tell me. Who is nurturing these children? Who is inculcating in these children the love of Allah and the love of our ummah? And years go by, the child grows up and the child realizes, my mom and dad taught me one thing and one thing only, which was work as hard as you can for this dunya. Because when you work hard for this dunya, people will call you successful. This is unfortunately what we are feeding our children. Our weddings have become so lavish that our children do not know anything than hiring a big hall, fancy cars, and spending as much as they can on clothing and food just to impress everyone else. Unfortunately, slowly, this is what's happened to our lifestyle. Materialism is slowly becoming incul inculcated in our hearts to such an extent that today, like the Prophet ﷺ, when he was mentioning about the end of times, he said, Yushik an tada'a al umam. He said, listen, O people, it's very close that a time will come when the whole of the world will slowly begin to scheme against you. They'll be calling each other for a dawat, for a dinner. And they'll be calling each other not to eat physical food, but to destroy you to rip you into pieces like someone rips bread into pieces. And the Sahaba said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the world, these are people who never saw the world. They never saw Persia. They never saw for Rome. They didn't even see these amazing places. And they were saying, the world will be after us. Are we going to be in small in number, O oh, Messenger of Allah? He said, no. But antum kathir, you will be large in number. However, your number will be like the froth on the ocean. You won't have any weight at all. 
you will have no value. People will look at you like they look at rubbish. Rubbish is in the way, just throw it to one side and carry on your, your journey. This is what we are going to become. And then the Sahaba said, what's the, what's the cure for this? What's the solution, O Messenger of Allah? What did he say? He said, the reason you're going to have this is because حُبُّ dunya wa karahiyatul maut. He says, love of this dunya will be in your hearts and the fear of leaving this world. Love of dunya, my respected brothers, is not that you live under a tree and you have patches on your clothes. Love of this dunya is where you are willing to compromise your salat, willing to compromise your fasting, willing to compromise your respect for your parents, willing to compromise the rights of Muslims around the world because otherwise you're going to lose some dunya. Otherwise you're going to lose some, some money, some income. This is what, it's, what it is. May Allah protect us from this. And may Allah inculcate inside of our hearts, bring inside of us the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the honor of standing up for your Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. Wallahi, this is an honor, my respected brothers. This is a great honor. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He talks about the people that He loves in the Quran, listen to what He says in Surah Ma'idah. He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O those of you who believe in Allah and His Messenger, man yartadda minkum an deenihi, He says, be warned, whoever amongst you leaves their faith, فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ Allah will bring a people better than you. Allah will bring a father better than you. A mother better than you. A taxi driver better than you. One who runs a masjid better than you. A leader, a politician better than you. <coughs> a president better than you. Who Allah will love. And they will love Allah. يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Then he further says, these are people who will humble themselves to their fellow Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. They will find excuses to forgive their brothers and sisters. They will make themselves as though they are servants for their brothers and sisters. Do whatever they can, even if it is tying a stone to your stomach. Even if it is flickering the light so that your brothers and sisters are unaware that you have no food to eat for yourselves, but you're ready to give whatever you have in your kitchen to your brothers and sisters. This is what the Sahaba were. يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَ Allah says, He says, these men that you have with you, these are no ordinary men. These are men and women who are ready to give up everything for the others because of love of Allah. أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَعِزَّةٍ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ And these people are staunch against disbelievers. Staunch against those people who are ready to break our values and principles. Staunch against those who are ready to commit genocide against our brothers and sisters. Whether it be Bosnia, whether it be Kashmir, whether it be Palestine, whether it be Rwanda, wherever our Muslim brothers and sisters are, color doesn't matter, my respected brothers. La ilaha illallah matters. This is why when the Dajjal appears, many people unfortunately will follow in the footsteps of Dajjal will listen to his flutes, listen to his words, listen to his advice. But unfortunately, <coughs> by following the Dajjal, they will be giving up their faith. And the true believers are the ones who understand that the material things of this world mean nothing if it does not mean supporting Allah's religion. This is the first lesson that we learn. This is the first lesson that we learn, my respected brothers, in Surah Al-Kahf. The second lesson that we learn in Surah Al-Kahf is subhanAllah, is the lesson about knowledge. A time will come, you look at today. This is what Yuvral Harari, the same guy I was talking about earlier, he says, he says AI will replace 70% of jobs. He says 70% of jobs he predicts will be replaced with AI. Slowly we see it's happening. People are being laid off. Why? Because a computer can do the job of 10 people. What someone would do, over two weeks, computer can do it within an hour. So he says, what's going to happen is, he says many of these doctors will be, will, will be uh, these GPs will become, will become redundant in society. Because if you have a human being who gets information according to human capacity, and then you have this computer 
who's getting information from all around the world in real time, in live time. And you want to find out what problem you have, you just have to trust the AI. Just now, a few weeks ago, AI has been used to detect <coughs> cancer in patients. Cancer that would normally take two weeks for a normal human doctor to detect. Now the AI can do it within a few minutes. You imagine. And what's slowly beginning to happen now is, is that the AI is now following everyone around. Now imagine you're a patient and you have this smartwatch on you, or you have your phone. And the smartwatch knows that you visited a particular takeaway. And also in that takeaway was another guy who had a serious illness. And then your smartwatch will tell your AI that, you know what, there's going to be a good chance that you're going to catch something from that guy. And then if you've been to that place and this place and this place, it predicts exactly what kind of illness you'll get. And even before you've got the symptoms, it'll be sending you the medicine down to your house. He said. And you imagine, better, and better, isn't it? You don't have to go to a doctor. Trying to call the doctor today is a mission as well. <laughs> it's a jihad in and of itself. <laughs> And the AI will just do it on the spot. Tell you all your problems. And it will tell you in live time. If you've got cancer in your body, it will tell you cancer is growing. You imagine that. This is not where it ends. He says it will go into the entertainment industry and it will get rid of actors. You won't need actors anymore. You can bring actors back to life. A famous actor that has passed away, a famous singer that has passed away, the AI could record songs better than that actor could, or that singer could ever record them. And it's happening now. And he said, what's going to happen in the future, he says, people will have a, normally when you read a novel, he said, you read the novel and the novel is written by a particular author. So when you read through the novel, the novel will never change. But he says the AI, what the AI will do is interesting. He says it will take your reading and it will read your your vitals and it will pick up when you enjoy reading the story and then it will change the rest of the story to keep you interested everyone will have their own story to read and people say wow this is going to be so amazing imagine watching a football match and you want man united to win <laughs> every match man united is winning for you and every match liverpool is winning for them and every match Inshallah, it won't happen. <laughs> just in case some guys over here get a bit too excited. But this is the scary stuff. This is just a tip of the iceberg of what's to come. And they say, the Prophet ﷺ, he said about the Dajjal. He says, when the Dajjal comes, the Dajjal will have with him, he says, a river of water and a river of fire he will have with him. And some narrations say he will have a garden with him. And he will present to people his idea of what he wants. And people will either take the garden or people will either take the fire. And he said, the Prophet Sallallahu said, the garden will be truly be fire for the people and the fire will be a garden for the people. He says, the fire will be a garden for the people and the garden will be a fire. Now you look at what's happening in the world today. The world has this ability. We know before, before the 1800s, there was no international agreement around the world of, that, of countries not fighting one another. The world before the 1800s was a wild place. There were always wars going on. If we had BBC News, well actually BBC is biased anyway. If we had Al Jazeera News, let's say, and it was in the, before the 1800s, you would have found war taking place in this country, war taking place in this country, war taking place in this country. Countries were at loggerheads with one another. Countries were literally killing each other continuously. And if you look in Isl Islamic history, you'd always see this as well. Muslims have always been at war with other countries around them. And unfortunately, at war with one another as well. It was only when the international treaty was made, and this was in the 1800s, and then World War I broke out, and then they made another one, a League of the World. Then this, <coughs> this the World War II broke out, and then they had to come out with a UN. And now the UN has the power to be able to dictate to countries around 193 countries around the world. It has the power to dictate how they should be running their country. And who provides funding for the country? No other than the IMF. An organization that's based upon riba. 
It's based upon an economic system which Allah calls waging war with Allah and His Messenger. Waging war with Allah and His Messenger. And unfortunately, many of these countries have to bow down to them to get funds. And you see what happened in Pakistan recently. And you see what happened in many of these countries. IMF promised to give them money if they allow LGBT to be put into the policy of their country. Now you imagine, someone is providing you money because they want you to accept their values and principles. They're making you brainwash your children into believing that LGBT is okay. As Muslims, we have no problem with it. Na'udhu <coughs> billah. And the same thing slowly is happening to these other countries. This is why when the Dajjal comes, it's very important to have knowledge. Understand what Islam is about. Understand what it means to be a leader of a Muslim country. To be a leader of a Muslim house. To be a leader of the community. Every single one of us, the Prophet Sallallahu said, is responsible for his flock. And every single one of us in the day of Qiyamah will be questioned about this. You might be living your life 20, 30 years have gone by and you think you're getting away with all of these things. But remember, the day of Qiyamah and the day, Yawma Tubla Sara'ir, the day on which all of the secrets will become exposed. The day in which even those things you thought Allah had forgotten, those things that even you forgot, Allah is going to bring them up one by one with exact details and timestamps of when you did this. This is why the teacher of Imam Malik rahimahullah, Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir, Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir was a famous teacher in Medina. One day his wife in the morning sees him weeping and weeping and weeping uncontrollably. And so his wife goes to one of his friends, Ibn Abi Dhib, and she says, please, can you see my husband? I don't know what's wrong with him. He's been weeping all night on the prayer mat. So he goes, Ibn Abi Dhib, he goes there and he says to Muhammad, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's happened? Maybe some, maybe there's been a bereavement in the family. Maybe something else has happened. He said, I was praying my salat at night, my tahajjud. And whilst I was praying, he says, I came across this verse of the Quran. Subhanallah. What was the verse of the Quran? On that day, they will see that which they imagined that they would never see. Allahu Akbar. They will see that which they imagined that they would never see. He says, when I heard this, he says, I began to weep. Allah is going to bring everything in front of me. Those things that I never imagined Allah will ever recall. Allahu Akbar. Yawma tubla sara'ir. All of the sins, everything that we have done, good or bad, whatever we've done, we're going to be held accountable for it. This is why this is the time, my respected brothers. Turn back to Allah before it's too late. Fix your ways. Repent to Allah. And if you've harmed anyone else, get them to forgive you as well. Because if you don't get them to forgive you, remember you'll be like that man who comes on the day of judgment with mountains of deeds. But when he's brought in front of Allah, Allah will say, you hurt so-and-so, and you harm so-and-so, and you abuse so-and-so, and you took from so-and-so, and you did so-and-so, you backbited so-and-so. All of the people will be called together. And a line will be made as far as the eye can see. And people will slowly begin to take from his deeds, one by one, until nothing is left. And people are still coming, the Prophet ﷺ said. People are still coming. And then, he says that Allah will say to all of these people, place your sins onto his scale. Place your sins onto his scale. My respected brothers, the issue of the Dajjal is a very, very serious one. It's not just a person appearing. It's everything that will be set up, the whole system of the world that will be set up in order for his, his appearance. The third thing of this surah, Surah Al-Kahf, is about the importance of what technology will play. In this surah is mentioned about the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Dhul Qarnayn was a powerful leader of the past who was a believer in Allah. And he traveled the east and he traveled the west. And wherever he would go, he would always apply justice to people. He was like the UN of the past, but the HMC version. <laughs> Honestly, this is what he was. He was just an, he was an international negotiator. He was an international man. A person that would go country to country, village to village with, his, with all of his army and all of his technology and sort out problems for them. Until he came to a place 
And this place, this place that he came to, there was a tribe that was being attacked by a foreign tribe known as the Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And he, what, what does he do? He builds for them a wall. Now this, according to my reading of the Quran, this is the only place in the Quran, apart from Ibrahim alayhi salam's building of the Kaaba, where Allah mentions about building a structure. There's only two places in the Quran from what I remember. Maybe someone can correct me. Where Allah mentions about building a structure. One was the Kaaba. The importance of the Kaaba we all know today. And the second was this massive wall that was going to stop the Yajuj and Majuj from attacking this tribe. So what does Allah say? Allah says, Zulqarnain said to the people, listen. He says, I will build a wall for you. He says, I don't need any money from you at all. Allah is going to reward me. He says, however, he says, you people are people of iron. Dig iron for me. Give me iron. Atuni zubar al-hadid. Bring for me blocks of iron. So they bring these blocks of iron and they place the blocks of iron like bricks one on top of the other, covering the entire two, the two sides of the, of the mountains. He says, eventually, when he covers the top, ufrigh alayhi qitara. He takes molten metal. And when you mix molten metal with iron, what happens is you get an alloy. You get one of the strongest substances that are known to mankind. Maybe it was steel. Maybe it was another alloy. But a strong alloy was produced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning this shows through your technology, if Muslims advance in this world, in their technology, Muslims can advance over all other nations. This happened in the past. In the time of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, in warfare, they used the, the cutting edge technology to fight against the enemies. It happened in the times of the Ottomans. And it happens, it's been happening all the way. Unfortunately, somewhere in history, we've forgotten this. We've forgotten to educate our youngsters in becoming people who push for an advanced Muslim society. And unfortunately now, who has the technology? The West has the technology. And everyone has to buy from them. And it's because of us having to buy from them is that they're able to sell it to us and they're able to sell it to the enemies and causing Muslims to fight amongst one another. Inna lillahi wa inna rajul. Now I want to finish off on the story of the Dajjal. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, one day he was giving a talk and he said, listen everyone. He says, remember I used to tell you about the Dajjal. He says, today I want to tell you about the Dajjal from this man, Tamim Dari. Tamim Dari was a Christian who had, ex had accepted Islam and he was from the land of Palestine. He was a sailor. He says, one day we got in our boats and we began to sail. He says, we were sailing for over 24 days. He says, when the water started to become volatile, weather became bad. We didn't know where we were going and the boat pushed us, washed us up on a shore. We came out of our boats and we saw that there was this beast standing there. You couldn't tell the front from the back because of all the hair. He says, we went up to it and it said to us, he said to us, our leader wants to see you. The, the man in the monastery wants to see you. So they said, okay, we'll go. So they went inside this big monastery and they saw this big man who was chained up. His hands were chained to his neck and his shins were chained up. And as soon as he came close, he said, he said, are you from the Arabs? He said, yes. He says, has the city of Baysan stopped providing water? He says, no, the city of Baysan is a place located in today's Palestine. He says, the city of pa the gardens of Baysan are still providing water and they're still providing fruit. He says, has the water of the, the, the Sea of Galilee, at Tabariya, has it dried up? He said, no, water is still plentiful. He says, has the well of Zughar, which is a well situated just outside of Jerusalem. He says, has this dried up? He says, no, water is still plentiful. He says, when these three things happen, he says, when these three things happen, he says, my emergence will come. And he even asked about the Prophet Sallallahu emergence as well. Now you imagine, you imagine this. We don't know the reality of the Dajjal. We don't know how he's going to appear. The Prophet Sallallahu has told us about his fitna, has told us about the, 
trials and tribulations that the Dajjal will present to mankind. But what we have to understand, my respected brothers and sisters, is that will we be able to protect ourselves from the fitna of the Dajjal on our own? If our Muslim countries cannot protect themselves from the fitna of the Dajjal, if the leaders are incapable of protecting themselves from superpowers of today, what chance is there going to be for us to protect ourselves from an entity that is going to be stronger than the superpowers of today? Will have more influence than the superpowers of today. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, when the Dajjal comes, he will have the ability to be able to resurrect the dead. Allah knows how that is going to happen. And it's very important for us to understand that whenever the Prophet ﷺ speaks about the future, we always have to remember interpretation of that will only become clear to us when it happens. We will only know what this means when it happens. And I'll give you an example of this. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, a time will come in the future when a man will be able to talk to his wife at home through his belt. Imagine. He says, through his belt, he'll be able to speak to his wife at home. Maybe this is talking about the invention of the mobile phone. Maybe it's some other invention that we don't know yet. The Prophet ﷺ would give us a glimpse into the future, but the reality of this exactly happening, only Allah knows best. So when the Dajjal comes, the Dajjal will have the ability to resurrect. And like I was saying earlier on, and this is an interesting, this was an interesting documentary I was watching. There was a lady in New York, there were two partners, a lady and a man, you probably heard of this as one. Well. So the, the man died, he was a partner in a business, and she was very distraught. She had all of his messages in, his, in, in her phone, she was reading through them. She had an idea, why can't I get these messages and input these messages into a program and then make that program behave like my partner and respond to me just like I, he used to respond when he was alive. So she invented this, this AI that every time you speak to the partner, the partner would respond as though he's alive and learn even more. And so slowly this business began to pick up. Lots of people who lost loved ones would take all the messages that they had from them, input it into this, this software, and slowly be able to take out messages and responses just like their loved one used to respond to them. Now you imagine, if we are living in a time where we don't need to remember our dead anymore, that we don't need to remember those of our beloved who have passed away, and simply all we have to do is input all of their information into a software, into a, an app, and just go over the app and even have an avatar for them, an image, a moving image that looks like them, speaks like them, then what need are we going to have for <coughs> going through bereavement? There's going to be no need anymore. People will not feel sad anymore because they'll know if someone dies, all you have to do is put their information into a software, speak to them, and that's it. And this is the scariest thing. Because in the Surah Al-Kahf, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions about the man who had two gardens and who was boasting about his two gardens to another man. One of the things that Allah mentions in this, that Allah gave him gardens, وَلَمْ تَظْلِمْ مِنْهُ شَيْئًا And these gardens did not decrease anything from him. These gardens gave him everything that he had. In life, if you have everything that you have, if all your parents were alive forever, if you were alive forever, if your business never failed, if your car never broke down on you, you would never feel the need to submit yourself to Allah. Because you think you're a God yourself. You think you have the same powers as God. And this is what Dajjal will do in society when he comes. Dajjal will invent in people's mind the idea that you are a God. You don't have, you know, this is something which is an idea that some people even have today. Maybe we are really <laughs> gods of ourselves. May Allah protect us from all of this. Wallahi, respect your brothers. The reality is, fitna of Dajjal isn't something that we should brush to one side. Everything that is happening outside of this masjid is slowly infiltrating the Muslim homes. Co capitalism is a fitna of Dajjal. This is a society where you become so rich that you can place a price on anything you want and no one can say anything to you. They say that insulin around the world, they say, maybe someone correct me on this, there's only three companies in the world that have patents to insulin. 
and they set the price. And every time after 10 or so years, when the patent is about to expire, they change something in the insulin. And so they can have another 10 years of the patent. And the result of this is the poorest countries in the world will die because they can't afford the insulin. Even though the insulin will be really a fraction of the price they're selling it at. So the rich become rich and the poor become poor. And one of the scholars, I remember I was speaking to him and he was saying, the problem with capitalism and the problem with Muslim society is, he says, if Muslims begin to water down Islam with capitalism, in other words, if Muslims be come out with another version of capitalism, but they simply put the banner of Islam on it, eventually what will happen is, we will simply have a Frankenstein version of Islam. That's what we'll have. We'll have solved the problem of capitalism, but in reality, we've created a new type of capitalism inside of our Muslim brothers and sisters communities. And feminism is another issue. If we remove feminism from our societies, but inculcate feminism in our hearts, in our societies, a Muslim version of it, an Islamic feminism, ultimately the same problem that these people had with feminism is going to be the same problem that we have with our Islam. These are all isms that we have slowly begin to infiltrate. And like I said earlier on, if the father is working two jobs, if the mother is working two jobs, if the children hardly ever get to see their parents for 10, 15 years of their life, you tell me, where is this teaching coming from? Which part of Islam? How do we resolve this? How do we sort this out? It's difficult. This isn't going to change overnight. It's not as though we just take out all of our children and we just live in the jungle somewhere off the grid and we solve the problem. It doesn't work like that. We have to come out with a robust solution for this. A solution which is going to be conducive to protecting the Iman. Just like in Surah Kahf, those youngsters who went to the cave and protected their faith, this is what we have to do. We have to create for ourselves caves in our own community as well to protect our faith. At the moment, the LGBT thing has gone down because of what's happening to our brothers and sisters in Gaza. <coughs> Soon that will be up again. And that's going to be another issue that we're going to have to deal with in the coming years. May Allah protect us from that. Amen. All of these fitness of the Dajjal, my respected brothers, all of these fitness of the Dajjal slowly, slowly will begin to appear in our own houses. And Wallahi, I don't like saying these kind of things, but it's very important for us to understand. Atheism, atheism was a problem that we were in the past struggling with. Kids, youngsters starting to become atheists. But when the problem comes LGBT, when your children come home saying they want to have another gender and you have legally, you have no right to stop them, then what happens there? How do you deal with the problem? This is why the Prophet ﷺ would always seek protection in the fitna of the Dajjal. The fitna of the Dajjal is something which will affect every single individual when it happens. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to become people who understand the teachings of Islam. Amen. People who hold up the flag of La ilaha illallah in our communities. Hold up the principles and values of what it means to be a Muslim without having watered it down with the values of, of foreign elements. And allow us to stand up for our brothers and sisters wherever they are around the world. 